hope um, you're not too expectant about the future here. Um, unfortunately, alchemy is locked in the past, and to get anywhere near the future, we've got to have a wee look backwards at the history of it. Um, and it kind of stopped practicing about two, three hundred years ago. So um, arts have been catching up, uh, filling in the gaps since then. Science has abandoned alchemy. So we're catching up a bit, and um, yeah, filling in the gaps and looking a wee bit forward. But I'm going to look at current practice in projects of artists who use alchemy, um, the way of practicing, and that kind of collaboration between science and art. Um, okay, um, actually, uh, I'm also going to uh, uh, hand out some, these are not freebies, I want these back at the end of the talk, <laughs> but because alchemy is such a huge subject, um, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it, um, cross the stone and... Uh, Etc. Uh, 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 green and blue fixture, etc. There's some information on the back of these beer mats. These were originally handled, handed out free uh, at an arts festival in a pub um, with no commentary, just people used them to prop up beer tables or write somebody's phone number on. So there was no comment about what they were actually for. Um, okay, so um, you have a couple of the beer mats here. Um, I should just say that um, the image I handed uh, Nikki for promotional material was a phoenix and I'm a wee bit worried about that with the mm. tragedy that ensued in, in Glasgow this week so I just want to, wasn't sure who's in the audience so I'm just going to make a little statement about that before. Um, uh, okay, so, um, oops, yeah that was the first slide I was going to start with actually. So here we have a picture of Glasgow School of Art in its glory um, uh, on, in uh, Macintosh's imagination and his plans. Beautiful drawing. Okay, so I'm going to read. Uh, before I start, I'd first like to express my huge sadness at the devastating fire that engulfed Glasgow School of Art at the weekend and the bewilderment most of us feel at this tragic loss, compounded by the fact that progress from rebuilding and reconstruction work from the first fire seemed to be going so well. This was such a tragic day for Scottish culture collectively and particularly for the city of Glasgow and of course all the artists and students that have had the opportunity and joy to pass through those well-worn and much-loved doors, corridors and studios of that iconic structure of Macintosh's inspirational, aesthetic, technical and imaginative, imaginative vision. Um, okay, hopefully, like the alchemical phoenix that I mentioned in this talk, um, is some form of restitution that can eventually arise from the ashes and the burnt out shell across the city from here. My reference to the alchemical phoenix in particular in this talk is to reinforce the regenerative effect, creativity and the visual arts can have in transforming what seems like hopeless situations into more positive and manageable conditions, whether at a local or a global level. Um, so I'm coming from the um, creative industry, the visual arts. Um, I should just say I do teach at Duncan and Johnson College of Art, University of Dundee. So I have kind of built in some uh, aspect of higher education. Most of it's looking at uh, current art practice, but I thought I'd better just take a few of those boxes. So um, I will be looking at uh, um, some uh, some uh, uh, reference points if you're interested in that. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through my uh, initial statement, transmutation art as alchemy. Um, I suppose that could mean how does an artist survive in current society um, turning dross into gold. In alchemy, in alchemy, transmutation is the mystical process of turning lead into gold. Often mistakenly seen as the foolish quest for attaining great wealth, a more accurate interpretation is the inward journey to self-realisation and the process of revealing the ultimate universal truth. Whilst a career in art may bring riches and truth for the few, I would argue to survive in the current, uh, uh, survive in the current oops, uh, creative sector, the inward and outward journey must be the driving force for the artist and how then to transmute this inquiry and energy into new forms and amalgams, pal palatable to the audience in this ever-hungry, fickle phoenix of contemporary consumer society. Okay, so you can be like Glasgow artist uh, David Shrigley and turn your language into vast profits. I don't know how much he earns from his art, but it must be a lot. His books from the kind of 20th editions and things like that. Uh, and he's got his language, whether it's um, uh, what well, it's got to do with alchemy, I would yeah, say nothing, but uh, he has his own language, I think, which is important. Um, okay, well, 
Coincidence and chance are two of the driving force of my practice, and it was only after I'd suggested to Nikki last week the title of my pre presentation on alchemy and art that he mentioned this serendipity. The central character of the title of the seminar, Casting the Rooms, is himself an alchemist. I see Nikki mentioned that already. But, curious fact, one of a growing chain of coincidences that I always mean to record and to explore. However, that's for another time. So, okay. Alchemy, we all know these beautiful drawings from the past, very difficult to construe, to interpret. What do they mean? Are they gobbledygook? Are kind of the, uh, kind of Masonic rituals, etc.? But beautiful, uh, and you can spend a lifetime getting lost in those. I did for about two, three years, and then came out at the other end, a desperate and uh, enlightened man. Okay, um, I'd like to start with a few observations in alchemy and the contempt it generally provokes in the minds of contemporary science as a highly flawed and dismissed pseudoscience. And I would suggest not similar to the negative connotations contemporary and particularly conceptual art has in the minds of the British media. In my blog synopsis, whichever you prefer, I begin with the premise that anyone following a career in visual arts, particularly through higher education, should do it for the lifestyle of lifelong learning rather than the material rewards and that fortune like the phoenix is a fickle bedfellow. Um, although I work part-time with Dr. Johnson, I'm afraid I'm not going to reference much current research on the current state of creative graduates in Scotland. For anyone interested in the figures and current analysis of that, I'd recommend ECOS, the Economic and Social Development's Creative Graduates and Innovation Report for the Scottish Funding Council 2017, which I just saw is signed by my principal, so that's one of the reasons it's up there today. <laughs> Um, okay, there are certainly some interesting observations and conclusions in that relationship to employability in the creative, uh, sorry, in that relating to employability in the creative industries, considering gender, subjects, studied entrepreneurial expectation, wage skills, transferable skills, which came up, uh, uh, etc., both nationally and internationally. One I'd just like to highlight at this stage is that firms combining arts and science skills, other things being equal outperform those firms that utilize only art skills or science skills. So alchemy I see is this kind of strange um, mutation of science and art. Okay, right back to the more esoteric discussion and alchemy in art. The accusation of experts being made fools of and public money misspent has always followed the public discussion on art in the UK and mirrors the exclusive search historically philosopher's stones prime materia and elixirs of life. And controversy, whether financial or moral, is often at the centre of that public debate on art. For instance, Carl Andre's 120 brick sculpture, equivalent eight, if some of you remember that, on the uh, right up there, left, sorry, your left. Bought by the Tate in 1972, described universally as a, quote, rubbish, or more recently, Marcus Harvey's, again, a, quote, sick and disgusting portrayal of Myra Hindley, rendered with the cast of a child's hand in the sensation exhibition at the Royal Academy in 1997. Uh, okay, it's a long way from alchemy, but uh, bear with me. Uh, while the media continues its fascination with Ian Brady and the Moore's murderers, and to a lesser extent the money spent on arts and culture, Marcus Harvey was never one of the household names of young British artists, or this was the centrepiece of that exhibition. And at end, every end of the controversy spectrum and everywhere in between, every arts graduate in UK lives with justifying their career choice on a pretty regular basis to friends and family alike. There is no doubt that for the few, art is profitable. The David Shrigley's of this world, particularly the modest £2,297 paid originally by the Tate for Carl Andre's equivalent eight. I'm not sure what it's worth now. Um, but Satchery reputedly made a fortune in Harvey's Myra painting, uh, selling it for ten times the amount he originally paid the artist. Um, I think uh, it was ten thousand and a hundred thousand, the difference. Another alchemist, so basically Satchery is the alchemist in the art process of turning lead into gold. Uh, while I would love to advocate society full of employment for artists, uh, reminiscing in Egypt, all working away there, paid, pillars of society, etc. Um, uh, Medici Florence, you know, pretty good for artists then, all working in studios, etc. Good commissions from the papacy of the Medici. Um, uh, let's see, sorry, uh, Medici Florence in the 1500s are the great ideals of the Bauhaus in the early 20th century when artists are at the center of industry and uh, productivity, etc. Um, where does alchemy exactly fit in the scheme of things? That's what you were asking. Uh, in the picture of history of art, 
before I have a venture into the future of art education. So I might get there, let's see where we go. So apologies if I go backwards before we head forwards into deep space. I'll start where a lot of Western art is reputed to end and conceptual art begins with Marcel Duchamp. Okay, so some pieces, a few of his pieces there. Um, three stop standard stoppages, 1913-14 on the right, basically throws bits of string down, uses them here, and then he cuts these pieces of wood. Uh, they're each a metre long, drop from a metre height, and they're packed in this box. Very contemporary, this is from 1913. Uh, um, whilst there's no doubt that alchemy, uh, sorry, whilst there's no doubt that like alchemy, Duchamp's work is laden with strange symbolism and codes, interpretations and reinterpretations, and various times he prescribed himself as an accidental alchemist, at other times he denied any affiliation with the royal art. So if you know anything about it, uh, Duchamp, like he's a trickster, like a bit like an alchemist. He's selling you something that you're not quite sure if it's lead or gold, and he loves playing these games with the audience. Um, okay, one curious pronouncement is his non-series of other, of often palindromic and vertically reversible verbal pieces. So he turns this upside down, and it still reads non. By making and this is by making language play an integral part in his game, where in the series he suggests. By using his Venus lead pencil, he changes lead into gold. By using the periodic table element classifications and turning PB lead into AU. And I really love that analogy of the artist with his lead pencil turning what he creates into gold. And obviously, uh, Duchamp's got to play with the Venus there, if you all know his kind of uh, fountain, the urinal, etc. He's playing with the idea of the, the uh, Venus goddess as the pencil, too. Duchamp's playfulness and codes of words and images, just like Leonardo's. Cryptic notes, and there's a lot of uh, online stuff, do you think uh, Leonardo's an alchemist or not? Uh, science machines, measurements, mathematics, optics, and perspective, and the use of chance procedures, uh, I advocate would surface, resurface in most savvy art students' sketchbooks at some time or other in their study. Um, and as it used to another creator, Mac Maverick, operating before the great division of art and science in the Age of Enlightenment, or some might say the Age of Darkness, if you're an artist, interestingly enough wrote more books on the occult and alchemy than he ever did on modern ideas of science and scientific inquiry. Nonetheless, he has been adopted by the scientific establishments as their erudite wise mascot up until the early 20th century to be superseded by Einstein's Age of Relativity and Oppenheimer's elemental nuclear transmutations. And that's about as good as you can get in alchemy. Um, okay, we could look at many other 20th century artists working as Latter-day Alchemists in this era of subatomic experimentation and study. So we'll look at a few. Um, Joseph Boyce, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with him, uh, alluded to alchemy together with many of his thematizations of transformations and processes of formation, as well as his direct interaction with materials, particularly gold. So here he is, the title of this piece is How I Explain Pictures to a Dead Hair, 1965. But he's covered his face in gold, and certainly a lot of the materials he uses is this kind of transformation and transmutation. Uh, another German artist very heavily influenced by Boyce is Kiefer. Uh, Anselm Kiefer's vast lead books and immovable libraries and his interconnected systems of history, mythology, culture, material and process um, are testament to this grey Frankenstein-like area where the scientist laboratory merges with the artist's studio. Uh, one artist I would like to mention uh, in particular is James Accord, the only artist who had the confidence and some might say lunacy to work directly with radioactive materials. Has anybody heard of James Accord? No. Okay. Um, he was the only private individual ever to have a license to import and handle radioactive material and wore the licensing number tattooed on the back of his neck. Um, not a very good slide there, but you can see it uh, here. His waste material came directly from the never completed German SNR 300 breeder reactor, a direct result, uh, strangely enough, of Joseph Boyce's intervention as Green Party member and activist in Germany into 1980 and Germany getting rid of all its nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear plants. So basically, he was working as an importer, he was importing some nuclear reactor rods. Friends of Carter, he is sitting beside uh, uh, Carter here, uh, and he works with uh, nuclear waste. Um, this is in uh, Nevada the Desert, beside uh, his storage depot. This is another process drawing, a bit like Duchamp's, where he grinds up radioactive ceramics and turns it into radioactive pellets. Complete lunatic, but a fantastic artist and a really inspirational talker. Um, so I'm going to talk down at the, there's an artist in residence at the Royal Academy in London and very uh, uh, inspirational. 
Um, Bach would, of course, not advocate working with any hazardous materials. The process of alchemy in the physical or metaphysical search for gold and our enlightenment, I think, directly relates to creativity. At this time, I would just like to illustrate a few of these mystical processes of alchemy that relate to my own and other practices. Unlike the classic alchemists who rely on collaboration and secretive, hermetically sealed isolation, uh, I'd like to follow the threads of tonight's meeting and show you an artist which I think blends science and art together intriguingly, the German artist Agnes Meyer Brandes, Brandes, particularly her arts capitalist commission for the Republic of the Moon, exhibition in London in 2014, described as a rehearsal for a living in space. Arts Catalyst, a really good um, organisation based in London who fund really experimental arts projects, uh, putting artists um, in orbit, etc. So this is her work, weaves together popular science and fiction and is inspired by 17th century English Bishop France Goodwin and his book The Man in the Moon, in which he flies to the moon in a chariot to to by moon geese. Is this sort of chariot? Uh, training of geese. She raised a family of moon geese from birth, assigning them astronauts' names like Yuri, Neil, and Buzz, and then training them to fly. A control room in the museum broadcast a live stream of the geese from some moon surface somewhere. So very low-tech, but really intriguing and a fascinating project. I think she trained them in the mountains in, in Italy somewhere. Also in this wonderful show was one of the most bizarre art events I've ever witnessed in true alchemical spirit, entitled The Brief History of Drinking in Space by art food gurus Bombas and Parr, who I think did some flavours of Heinz baked beans if you tried a cheddar cheese variety, um, where the visitors had to choose whether to drink as a Russian cosmonaut or US astronaut, depending on which side of the auditorium they originally chose, involving competitive vodka, space cocktails, frozen champagne, vintage port, communion, wine, and even ether sampling. Uh, these are all things that the astronauts tested in space. Um, vintage port was supplied by NASA before there were huge uh, cutbacks in the 70s. The Russians got vodka whenever they wanted it. Um, and um, here at Bombas and Pars, one of the parabolic sherry, I've got a sample of this actually, very nice. And it's, it's, strangely enough, it's the same sherry that NASA chose that Sir Francis Drake used on his trip. Um, uh, to, uh, across the Atlantic, and it's the same. Same. Uh, it was supposed to. It lasted well with salt and, and uh, extreme conditions, etc. <coughs> so, in, in the 70s, NASA spent about half a million dollars studying which wines would be the best to complement for astronaut space food. Even commissioning Californian onologists. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation to recommend the ultimate orbital wine and food pairing. According to reports, Russia had its own differently dysfunctional relationship to alcohol, which meant that cognac was prescribed to cosmonauts on extended missions in order to stimulate our immune system and on the whole to keep our organisms in tone. Now it says organisms, organisms in the quote, but maybe that should be organs. But uh. So the Russians loved drinking, and uh, apparently Buzz Aldrin did Holy Communion when he landed on the moon. He had a tiny little bottle of red wine, tiny little cross, and tiny little wafer, which he ate. Um, and he then said that he wished he dedicated it not to Christendom but to humanity. Mm -hmm. And Neil Armstrong refused to have anything to do with it. So, uh, anyway, so religion was on the moon, I'm afraid, before anything else. Um, my own study in alchemy followed this with a collaboration entitled Dark Matters with Edinburgh Printmakers. Um, how are we doing in time, Nikki? We got we okay. Thanks, uh, uh, yeah. Right, okay. Um, okay, so I got interested in alchemy, um, reading lots of books and working on a project with astronomers. And this was a project, Dark Matters, projected in a building. This is the new Edinburgh Printmakers uh, in Fountain Bridge in Edinburgh. And it was basically to coincide with an eclipse of the moon. Right, so I'll read it in my notes, not go off, off notes here. Uh, so after an initial blind date event, we matched astronomers with artists in a series of events and exhibitions coinciding with the total solar eclipse in March 2015. So this coincided with the solar eclipse, and we presented this projection uh, uh, coinciding with the actual eclipse. Um, after that extensive uh, research, I took my alchemical investigations further, and using the matter of an alchemical aviary, Excuse me, presented an ecological comment on global warming and dwindling numbers of rare birds, particularly the dotterel in the Cairngorms. Mm. Uh, okay, there's the dotterel. Uh, those being maps passed around, although I was using al 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 alchemy as a kind of transmutation, I saw this little bird. It, every year it moves up the Cairngorms, um, six inches a foot, depending on global warming, and it's going to take its last flight at some point in the next few decades. It's going to transmutate from the ground into ether, from earth into air. 
and not come back. That's going to be it. It's going to be gone, and that's uh, the last of its flight. It'll go to Norway, but it'll depart Scotland forever. So I was using another word. Uh, all these birds have got uh, symbolism in um, in alchemy. Uh, obviously, the phoenix, the rebirth. The pelican is quite an interesting one if you can see it up there, um, just above the doctor's head. It pecks its own belly uh, to feed its uh, young, and is seen as a as a symbol of um, uh, sacrifice. Okay. Um, I know in the short talk I've arrived at practicing artists rather than student graduates. Fundamentally believe in the role of artists as creative, experimental, free-thinking individuals, latter-day alchemists, and their potential for influencing society from the inside, philosophically and materially rather than from the margins as purely visual commentators. And not just as isolated individuals, but working in collaborations, formal and informal self-initiating commissioned across all public and commercial sectors, turning society's dross into metaphorical yellow gold. Um, all right, I've just got some example of uh, some graduates. I thought we maybe should look at the uh, higher education is where it's going. To give one recent example of Duncan and Jordanson College of Art graduate as creative explorer, not in space, but as close as they can get to it. It does look a bit like the surface of Mars, that. Uh, adventurer and entrepreneur, I'd like to highlight the work of graphics graduate Laura Gale and her partner, who are currently orbiting somewhere in the Lake District. So their website just says, where are we now? And you follow them as they travel the world. Uh, in their yellow VW Californian beach van, designing and selling T-shirts, describing themselves, stripping back to our essential human needs to live comfortably and efficiently, we free up space in our minds and live to pursue what we want. By doing what we want, we are inspired to create, innovate, and work. So generally, the stream of graduates at art colleges to get a job in industry, sell your soul in advertising, a commercial studio, that these people have done something else, which I think, and also the yellow metaphor as gold is quite quite interesting. A pretty sound philosophy for any creative individual, I'd suggest. Um, okay. Um, I admit only mild justification for my premise of the artist and alchemist uh, tonight, returning to the idea of Isaac Newton or Leonardo da Vinci, da Vinci not as possible flawed individuals, but free radicals of open-ended ideas creatively, impervious to the constraints, barriers, and limits that society puts on individuals, particularly those following a creative calling. The individual following the runes wherever they may lead, possibly in sci-fi terms like Barbarella, following Pygar the angel, or was it vice versa? Um, okay, so whilst I do not advocate the hermetic isolation and secrecy of an alchemist's lifestyle, he does have obviously associations with the, own, with the lonely artist studio Garrett. Um, okay, it's the uh, alchemist. Uh, in his little uh, cocoon, a bit like a Vostok spaceship, that Gagarin was in there, and Gagarin here in his uh, in his module. Um, uh, so the lonely artist Studio Garrett, I would suggest, is more in common with the remoteness and seclusion of a hermetically sealed capsule floating past countless suns, purposely into the blackness of space. Thank you. Thank you.